Luke 16 and 10. Are you there? Are you believing? Hmm? Luke 16 and 10, Jesus said, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. He that is unjust in the least is unjust in much. Jesus said, whatever you do with a little bit, you do with a lot. A lot of folks don't believe that, but I believe what Jesus said. Hmm? There's a whole lot of people who say, well, now, if you'd give me something significant, I'd step up and do a good job with that. I'd handle it differently. Jesus said you wouldn't. He said you'd do the same thing with a lot that you do with a little. And this is the truth. You've got you to gotta watch about waiting for something big to come along before you're going to get serious. Hmm? You've got to watch about waiting for something substantial before you're going to really reach down and use all your resources and do the best job that you know how to do. That's, uh, it's a deception of the enemy. Big mistake. Be as faithful as you know how with the small thing. Right? Be as faithful as you know how with what's in your hand right now, what you have opportunity to be involved in right now. Because uh, if the Lord came tomorrow, this is it. This is what you're doing. Right? And I've seen so many people talk big stuff and make big plans and not do anything in the present and keep talking about later on and what's going to happen and 10 years pass and 20 and 30 and 40 and they're gone. And they never did any of it. You ever seen this or heard this? There's a lot of big talkers and precious time is clicking by. If we're going to do something, we better do it today. Today is the day. Of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Do you know you've never done anything tomorrow? Hmm? Well, we'll do it tomorrow. Well, when tomorrow gets here, what is it? And if you're going to do it tomorrow, at some point, it's got to be, we're doing it. We're doing it today. We're doing it now. And you got to watch about assuming you've got all this time. How much time do you have? <laughs> the Bible said be redeeming of the time. It's precious. We don't need to miss one opportunity. We don't, we, we don't need to waste one week, one day. Do we? No. We don't have it to blow. Right. We don't have it to waste. He said, verse 11, if you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you trust the true riches? And if you've not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? You've got to be faithful in the little things. You've got to be faithful in that which is someone else's. Now, just to, to sum up some things we've already gone over, do you know how you're faithful with that which is someone else's? You handle it the way they want you to. Because it's theirs. Right? Not the way you think best. <laughs> the way they want you to handle it. Because it's theirs. And verse 13, no servant can serve two masters. Who can do it? Jesus said nobody can do it. Either he'll hate the one, love the other, he'll hold to the one and despise the other. They keep getting, e they keep getting in each other's way. You cannot serve God and mammon. Verse 14, And the Pharisees also who were covetous heard all these things and they derided him. It hit them square between the eyes and they didn't like it. Because they were trying, that's exactly what they were trying to do was serve God and money. Yeah. They had two masters. And they were covetous. And they, instead of humbling themselves and getting right, they resisted and mocked and derided him. Verse 15, Jesus said, you are they which justify yourselves before men. You know, when you're wrong, don't try to justify yourself. 
Don't try to explain it away. There are times when you just need to, to bow your head and say, I'm wrong. No excuse. I need to change. I'm going to change. You don't, you don't need to add a bunch of stuff to it and try to help or try to put some of the responsibility on anybody else. You just need to, to take responsibility. This is one of the biggest areas where people, including Christians, are falling short, right and left. Christians are missing it, but they can't get it fixed. They continue to miss it month after month and year after year because they don't take responsibility. People say, well, so-and-so led me astray. I got in a bad deal with somebody and they took advantage of me. So they'll stay bitter and, and they won't forgive people and hold a grudge and, and uh, relatives that had problems with them uh, or family or, or whatever the case might be, business, money, and get bitter and stay bent out of shape and won't forgive people and hold grudges for years. And not take the responsibility that if I had been better led, I wouldn't have got in business with them to start with. If I'd have been better led, I wouldn't even have been at their uh, place or been in that situation to get in that fight with them. I could have completely avoided that situation. Or if I'd have just kept my mouth shut. <laughs> huh? The Lord checked me, but no. I had to tell them what I thought about it. <laughs> and then they had to tell me. And then here we go. <laughs> but, but I mean, just, just right and left people everywhere, church going people, they don't do it. They don't take responsibility. They just get mad and blame them for everything and stay mad at them and stay bitter and bent out of shape and take no responsibility for any of it. And if you do that, you can't get it fixed. You'll keep doing the same thing. You'll keep having problems. But if you'll take responsibility, you'll get grace and mercy and help. And instead of messing with the same old nasty, bitter stuff 30 years from now, you can get free of it. Get, get free of it. Get it behind you. Get done with it and go and live your life. Not be burdened down with all this stuff. Somebody say amen or owe me. Or... Uh, he said, you know, verse uh, 15, is that what it was? Yeah. You're they which justify yourselves before men. God knows your heart. What's highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Two different value systems. Now go with me. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot more here, and if you haven't been with us, please go get the previous materials. We've covered a lot of ground already that I won't take time to go over tonight. But go with me back to Genesis, the 14th chapter, and let's kind of pick up where we left off last time. I'm going to... I'm going to minister to you like you heard everything that went before. So if you didn't, you need to go back and get it. But for time, I don't think we have the time to just cover everything again. We have seen that covetousness is idolatry from Colossians 3, 5. It's, it's putting something in the place of God. And it's wanting something more than you want him. And uh, if you, we made this phrase, I believe the Lord gave it to me. If you want something too much, you'll go too far. And the enemy is counting on this. I tell you what, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm moving a little bit too fast. Go to 2 Corinthians, our other scripture that we've looked at. 2 Corinthians 11, we had looked at the second chapter where it said we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. And if you look at the 11th chapter here, uh, verse 2, the Spirit of God through Paul said he was concerned about them, verse 3, that they not be beguiled 
through the devil's subtlety like Eve was, and that their minds be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. And if you skip on down to what is it about the uh, uh, 13, how about that? He said these false apostles or deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, verse 14, no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. People are looking for the wrong thing when they're looking for the devil. They're looking for a red suit and a pitchfork and, and horns. And No, he comes as like an angel of light. He is the original con man, the defrauder. And, and what he did with Eve, he convinced her she's getting everything she wants. And the truth is, he was stealing everything from them. But he convinced her, and Adam followed her, that this fruit, forbidden fruit, was beautiful to look at. It was, had to be wonderful to taste and experience. That's the desire of the eyes, desire of the flesh. And the pride of life, it would make her wise. They were already wise. They were already children of God. What they didn't have was knowledge of evil. And I assure you, uh, a year after they got some knowledge of evil, they wished they'd have never had any knowledge of evil, right? There's some things you're better off never finding out, never knowing. And God knew that. But she decided she wanted that more than she wanted to believe God and trust him. And Adam did too, followed her in. And this is why it's such a serious sin. It's not a matter of, oops, made a mistake, <laughs> pick that fruit instead of that one. Wow, I'm so sorry. No, no, no. She was deceived, but she let herself be deceived. And he wasn't deceived and did it anyway. But it, it's obvious their actions speaking louder than words could. They chose that instead of God. Covetousness is idolatry. What's idolatry? That'd be, you know, literally, it's serving some other God instead of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So how can covetousness be idolatry because it's the same spiritual thing. It's the same heart issue. You want something more than you want him. And that is as serious as it gets. We have relationships with other people, our spouses, our siblings, our friends. And when it comes down to it, and they decide they want something else more than they want you. Does that affect you? Do you care? Is it a non-issue? Well, it affects God too. It matters to Him. And right now, in this earth, there are millions and millions of people that are choosing something else other than Him. And it's sad because people are living, being born, living their whole life and dying and, and never once choosing him. Even though, whether they'd admit it or not, there were times in their life where whether when they were eight years old or when they were 18 or when they were 80, there were times when they had glimmers and they realized there's something bigger than me. There is a God. There is something to this. But they, they chose something else. And even people that were face to face with Jesus chose something else. Judas, right? He ate with Jesus. He traveled with Jesus just like the others. He uh, heard the, the messages. Do you think he heard some good preaching yeah. and teaching? He saw the miracles. 
He saw the healings. He saw the dead raised. And yet, he decides he wants a farm and a house and some stuff. So he said, the money. No, he went out and bought a field with the money. What does money mean? Money is what you can get with it, what you can do with it. He decided he wants a farm more than he wants Jesus. And he's willing to lie and deceive to do it. You couldn't say he wasn't around good ministry. Right? You couldn't say that the ministers didn't live right in front of him and so all the hypocrisy, he couldn't stand it. Now, we're talking about Jesus here. And Paul himself. You remember Paul saying, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. What does that mean? This is a man that traveled with Paul. He's seen miracles. He's seen demoniacs delivered, people healed, raised from the dead. He's heard this that we read about in our Bible in Romans and Galatians and Ephesians. He heard it preached in person, coming out of Paul's mouth. And yet he decides, I'm going to Vegas. <laughs> it's true. Or whatever was the equivalent. He loved this present age and world and what he could see and what he could feel and experience and the pride of life. And in doing so, it wasn't just a rejection of Paul. It was a rejection of God. Are y'all with me, saints? And you and I, every one of us, are making these decisions every day of our life. And it's actually pitiful what people have chosen instead of God. It is pitiful what people have missed out on the plan of God for a car, for a relationship that they never got anyway. For a house, I've seen numerous people miss the plan of God over a house and a little piece of land. I just, I couldn't leave. I couldn't leave it. You're going to leave it. You're about to leave it real soon. <laughs> oh, you're leaving it all right. <laughs> it's really pitiful what human beings are forfeiting the plan of God and the will of God over. But the Lord allows us to pick whatever we want. And, and the, to him, it's not about the stuff. It's about the heart. Yeah. And if you want it more than you want him, you can have it. He's looking for somebody that wants him. That's right. Has he found some of those people? Yes. Come on, has he found some of those people? Yes. In Missouri, in Arkansas, in Florida, on the internet, all of it. Has he found some? Yeah. Has he found? I'm listening for the people on the internet. I'm trying, trying to hear them too. Huh? Yeah. Come on, somebody say that loud. Lord, Lord I, love you I love you more than anybody, more than anything, more than, anything, more than, anything, more than my own life. More than my own life. I, love you. I love you. I have one master. Have one, one master. master. One master. One master. That's who the Lord's looking for. You don't have to know everything to know you love him more than you do everything else. You'd have to know all the scriptures. You don't have to know Greek or Hebrew. Or, hmm? God looks at the heart, doesn't he? And he knows if you choose him more than anything else. Or anyone else. And so when it comes. There, there will be things all through your life. That come up. That afford you the choice. We're really dealing with some heavy duty stuff here. When you think about. We're talking about. Why there was a tree. Of the knowledge of good and evil. In the garden. Why is there even one there? Why did God tell them, don't partake of that? Because you can't have real love, 
real faith unless people have a choice. Right? Unless, if there's no choice, then you don't know whether they'd choose something else other than you. Right? If, there, if, if there's no alternative, there's no freedom, no choice, there has to be freedom to choose. And there has to be something else to choose. Why is the devil still kicking around? Why didn't God blast him into the nether region, regions <laughs> millennia ago? Because you've got to remember that with him a thousand years is like a day. So it hadn't been that long to him. But even though the enemy's trying to do something else, he's allowing it. Because it allows people the opportunity to choose. Can you see this, friend? Yes. Else why, if there was no temptation, if there was nothing else to choose, you can't have real love or real faith. Now, opportunities will come up all through our life, and we'll have to make a choice. And we will make a choice. Question is, <laughs> will we choose the right one? Hmm? And uh, the enemy will, will endeavor to, to pull on us with things, and, and you'll see it in uh, James. You don't have to turn there, but they'll, they'll put it up on the screen for us. In James Chapter 1. Now you said you're believing with me, right? So hang in there. In James chapter 1 and verse 14, I'm going to read this from the complete Jewish Bible. We'll read 13. James 1, 13, complete Jewish Bible. He said, let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. Now, God's never involved in, in anything that's trying to pull you away from him. Or anything that's trying to get you to do evil and wrong. He's not in that. He's not the one tempting you to do wrong. What's actually happening? Verse 14. Each person is tempted when he's dragged off and enticed by what? Bait. Bait. See, you can't even blame this on the devil. <laughs> this is your own desire. <laughs> now the enticement is the devil. He can zero in on you wanting something that you shouldn't want. And he can bring it to you night and day. And he can, right? And he can, he can feed it and bring you imaginations. And <laughs> have you ever noticed if it's something you're not supposed to be around, how it keeps popping up? <laughs> That's the enemy. He's trying to bring it to your door, and bring it across your mind, and bring it to you. But the problem is not the devil. The problem is us wanting it. Now you can, you can play games and you can say, oh, Brother Keith, I've been sanctified and, and I never want anything. And you're a liar. You need to repent. You got flesh. Your flesh has not been born again. Hmm? Your flesh will do anything that an unsaved person's flesh will do if you'll let it. And your mind has not been completely renewed. Most people haven't been renewed much at all, actually. <laughs> and depending on what you're around, what, what desires are being fed, those are the ones that will be the strongest. Desires that are fed get stronger. Desires that are starved get weaker. So if you want to get free from a wrong desire, worst thing we could do is feed it. Right? right. But 
it comes down to this eventually because everybody's going to have some desires to deal with. And really the only thing that will empower you to not succumb to a wrong desire that everybody else is yielding to is that you desire something else more. You want to please God more than your flesh wants to do this. Hmm? You want to help people and be faithful to them more than your mind and flesh wants to do that. Are y'all with me, saints? And there'll come a point where you'll choose hmm? which you want more and that no matter what you say, that proves what you love more. Because that's what you chose. Now that doesn't mean that it's game over, the end, you failed, you're out. What have we been talking about on Sunday mornings around here? For huh? There is a way out and there is a way back. Oh, thank God. It's called repentance and faith in God. And the blood of the Lamb can cleanse you. Hallelujah. You can be forgiven and washed. But that does that doesn't fix what got you in trouble to start with. If you're really going to get free and stay free, what has to change? What you, you gotta you gotta decide you want him. More than you want that. You you want to please him. You want to obey him more than you want that. And you do have the greater one inside you as a believer. So if you'll set your heart to to desire him and to please him more and you take steps that way, you will get help. The greater one will come in and help you. you, But if you decide, no, I want this, I want the flesh, I want the world, well, the angels will stand by and let you do it. The Holy Spirit will stand by and let you do it. Because it's what you chose. That's what you want. In, uh, let's keep reading here. In James, verse 14, the complete Jewish Bible, he said, Each person is being tempted when he's being dragged off and enticed by the bait of his own desire. Then, having conceived, the desire gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Don't delude yourselves, my dear brothers. We make it so much easier on ourselves if we will cut off anything that feeds the wrong desire. And now we're talking about holiness. Hmm? What? People mock and make fun of holiness, but you ought not. It's precious. And it's actually the easiest way to live. You make it so much easier on ourselves if we stay away from the ungodly, worldly stuff that stirs up the wrong desires. We make it easier on ourselves. If we cut it off and stay away from it, somebody says, oh, y'all just think y'all are holy, holier than thou. No, we just like being free. (laughs) Not having to repent five times a day. Come on, are you listening to me? We like living free. And it ain't about about proving somebody how holy we are. It's about we do genuinely love him more. We love him more than we love this. Didn't the Bible say in 1 John, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. What does that prove? It proves you love the world more than you love him. And that's your choice. He mentioned the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, the pride of life. And every one of us has been pulled that direction. And we can be pulled that direction. I don't care if you've walked with the Lord for 40 years. If you decide to start looking that way and thinking about it and feeding on it, it can pull you that way. And if you do it long enough, what, what did Eve do? Would, would they have made it so much easier on themselves if when the serpent started talking, huh? And said anything about disobeying God, they'd have said, no, 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 no. 
And they ran out of the garden and said, no. No. And they went somewhere else. Why? Nobody is going to get us to be unfaithful to God. Nobody's going to get us, if they'd have said, nobody's going to get us to disobey God. We're not going to do it. We love him more. I don't care what you got for sale. I don't care what you think you say you're going to do for us. Because no matter how good it looked, you could say, this is not just about me, what I think I want. I love him more, regardless of what I get or don't get. But they chose the other way. They chose for themselves, willing to sacrifice what they had with him, not understanding what they were giving up. The devil deceived them. He tricked them. And he's been doing it ever since. But we're not ignorant. Do we read in the scriptures? We're not ignorant of his devices. Whoo, hallelujah. It's good to be free. It's good to stay free. In Genesis, we talked about this. I'll just touch base on it and, and keep going. But Abraham, when God used him to deliver his family members, Lot and their family and Remember the king of Sodom came in, in Genesis 14, 22 or so, and, and he said, you know, take all the stuff, which would have been the wealth of a whole city or more than one city, and, and we'll keep the people. And uh, what did Abram say? I've lifted up my hand to the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. Keep reading. I will not take from a thread, that, that's the word for string, or a shoe latchet, we'd say shoe lace or sandal lace, a string. I'm not taking anything that is yours. Why? Lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. Now God had already told him it was his will for him to be blessed and rich. And a lot of people would have seized on this and said, well, it's God's will for me to be rich. And here's millions of dollars. So yes, I'll take it. But he knew this wasn't God's way. He knew this wasn't the channel that God would use. Here's a man who doesn't even believe in God. These folks are the most wicked people in the whole area. They got no respect for God, no love for God. God's not using these people. This is not God. And when he was faced with this situation, just say yes and get millions of dollars, <laughs> or say no, I will only have it God's way. Proves. You love God more than you do millions of dollars. And every one of us will have to pass these kind of tests. Or not pass them. But we will have these kind of choices. And it might not be on these amounts, but I assure you, Abram has dealt with this kind of thing before. You, you can see he, he's not struggling about which way he's going. He said, I've already lifted my hand to God on this. I've already told the Lord what I'm doing. And I'm not taking anything from you. If it's not God, then who's going to get the glory? And he said, I'm not going to have it unless God gets the glory. Now, a lot of people would agree with that and say amen in church. But when it comes time to whether you're turning down money or whether you're going to have to wait on what, what it is you want or to get or what you want to do, many make the wrong choice. Now the same thing happened, same kind of thing happened in 2 Kings 5, 16, when Naaman was healed and he came to the man of God and after he was healed, he tried to give him treasure, clothes, and, and uh, mineral wealth. And 
The man of God said, as the Lord lives, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. He said, oh, I'm not going to take it. And it's not because he wouldn't take offerings and money, because he did. There's accounts of it in the Word. He took money, he took food, he took clothes, he took things. But not today. Not this time. Obviously the Lord told him, no, not, not, don't do this on this one. And the man that worked for him, Gehazi, couldn't stand to watch all that money just go down the road. <laughs> and so he ran after him and lied to him and told him that the man of God changed his mind and sent him and told him he could give it to him. Hmm? And he hid it and then showed back up. And when he walked back in to the presence of the man of God, verse 20. Excuse me. Uh, skip on down to verse 25. He went in and stood before his master. Elisha said, where are you coming from, Gehazi? <laughs> and he said, I, nowhere. Nowhere. He said, didn't my heart go with you when the man got out of his chariot to meet you? He said, I was there. My spirit was there. I saw it. Is it a time to receive money and receive garments and olive yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and men servants and maid servants? Now, is God against you having money no. or clothes or lands? No, but does it matter when it happens? And does it matter who it comes through and how it happens? Oh, it matters a great deal. A great deal. And we've got to be able to discern it. But if you love the stuff too much, you won't want to hear, this is not the day. Will you? You won't want to hear that. You won't be willing to hear that. The flesh says, get it now, anyhow. Yeah, yeah but I don't, something's not right about this. And yeah, but, uh, and, and, and the, the, if you're covetous, that money and that stuff means too much to you. So you'll push that down and you go, ah, we'll, we'll figure all that out later. I just, uh, no, you know, just get the money in the bank. And then we'll talk about it and <laughs> do the deal and. And you're failing a test. You're showing you care more about that than what God's telling you. And Gehazi showed his heart, didn't he? He knew. He heard what the man of God said. This is not a day to accept stuff from this man. I don't know all the reasons God had, but I know he had good reasons. For one thing, he's probably trying to pay for his healing. And, he, and that's a time not to receive it. Right? Because you can't pay for your healing. It's already been paid for. Watch about giving offerings for healings. Or giving offerings for things that have already been bought and paid for. You can't buy salvation of a loved one. You can't buy healing or deliverance. Are y'all with me? And so, he says, is it time to receive this? Verse 27, the leprosy therefore of Naaman will cleave to you and to your seed forever. And he went out from his presence, a leper as white as snow. He brought a curse on himself by lying and stealing. And, and it, see, here's, here's what's so serious about this. This man, Naaman, goes down the road thinking that the man of God is fickle. Huh? Or that God changed his mind. And none of that's true. And what was supposed to happen with the man was him to see, you know, how many people do you offer a bunch of money and stuff to and they say no? Hmm? How many? And yet, when he runs face, he comes face to face 
with somebody who really does know God and really is hearing from God and that's what God said to him. That was what was supposed to happen and it was supposed to be the end of it and that would have set that way with that man the rest of his life and he would have known this had nothing to do with money. Right? And there is a real God and there are real men and women of God. But Gehazi muddied that all up. Didn't he? Left the idea that yeah, he changed his mind and we'll take some money. That's why it was so serious. One of the most serious judgments you can read about in the New Testament was Ananias and Sapphira. Right? What was it over? Money. <laughs> right? You, you hear a lot of people today say, ah, oh, we shouldn't talk about money. Money's not important. Well, you, you don't read the same Bible I do. And it's not because God cares so much about a thousand dollars or a billion dollars. What would that be to someone who creates stars? But you know what he does care about? Your heart. And where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And when you choose something over him, it shows where your heart is. And the only way we can show that we really do love him more than this other stuff is to have opportunities, right? Where we actually get to choose. And even though there are times, you know, God wants us to have everything, he's a good God. He, he's, a, he's a gracious, kind, abundant Father. You believe that? He wants you to have everything you need and a lot of every good thing you desire and have plenty to give to others, but it matters how it comes. I said it matters how it comes. 1 Timothy 3. 1 Timothy 3. It's not what you have. It's how you got it. Hmm? First, First Timothy 3, in the Amplified, verse 1, these are qualifications for pastors and then also overseers and also uh, deacons, which are helpers in the church. He said, this saying is true and irrefutable if any seeks the office of a bishop, an overseer. He seeks an excellent task. Keep reading. A bishop must give no grounds for accusation, but be above reproach. The husband of one wife, circumspect, temperate, self-controlled, must be sensible, well-behaved, dignified, leave an orderly, disciplined life, must be hospitable, showing love for, being a friend to believers, especially strangers or foreigners, be capable and a qualified teacher, not given to wine, not combative, but gentle, considerate, not quarrelsome, but forbearing and peaceable. Now, what about all these qualifications? A lot of times people look at that and they go, wow, high standard. Yes, it is. But you see, the thing is, everything produces after its own kind. This is supposed to be reproduced through the whole church and church is. Right? And it's rare for people to rise much above their leaders. So if you've got leaders with low standards... Can you see this? Yes. Everything produces and reproduces after its own kind. And, you know, these leaders are supposed to represent the head of the church himself. And then all of us are. He, he went on to say, not a lover of money, insatiable for uh, wealth and ready to obtain it by question, questionable means. Now, the King James says what? Filthy lucre. Hmm? Yeah. Now that's a King James word if there ever was one there. <laughs> that's Elizabethan. Filthy lucre. The, the phrase filthy lucre is not even in some of these verses, but it is implied. What is filthy lucre? Uh, skip down to the eighth verse. The deacons, likewise, must be grave not double tongue, not given to much wine, and not greedy of filthy lucre. The Amplified says, 
not greedy for base gain, craving wealth, and resorting to ignoble and dishonest methods of getting it. Is this talking about how you get it? Yes. Makes all the difference how you get it. We've got to have a high, high standard, and for a lot of people, much higher than they've had, a high standard of how we get it. Yes, we believe God's a good God. Yes, we believe we're supposed to prosper and have good things and nice things and everything that we're supposed to have. And even a lot of things that we just desire. But it must come the right way through the right channels and the right time. Elsewise, who gets the glory? Why wouldn't Abraham take all that stuff from the king of Sodom? Because if the king of Sodom does it, the king of Sodom gets the glory. And he already knew what they would say. They would say, Abraham owes everything he's got to the king of Sodom. This wicked, wicked, ungodly. Come on, are y'all with me? And can you see why he was the way he was? No way. I am not having that. Because I wouldn't have a pocketbook. Or a dollar in it if God didn't raise me up. Come on, are you listening? And send me out. And he did tell me he's making me rich. But it'll be by his hand, his way, his time. Or it won't be. Amen. And that proves you love him more than you love money and stuff. Because you won't receive it just anyway. And you're not willing to compromise yourself to get it. You're not willing to lie. You're not willing to steal. You're not willing to misrepresent. A lot of folks have the idea, well, you know, the ends justifies the means. It was a little iffy, but we're going to use it for some good too. Uh-uh. No, 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 no. With God, a seemingly good end never justifies a questionable means. Never. Never. It is so important how it happens. Skip down to Titus. He keeps talking about this same thing in Titus 1 verse 7 in the Amplified. Titus 1 7 in the Amplified. He says the bishop and overseer is God's steward must be blameless, not self-willed or arrogant or presumptuous. He must not be quick-tempered or given to drink or pugnacious. That's a word, isn't it? Don't be pugnacious. You ought to tell your friend that right now. Look over at him and say, don't be pugnacious. And tell him, okay, I won't be. He must not be grasping and greedy for filthy lucre financial gain. He must be hospitable, loving and a friend to believers, to strangers, foreigners, a lover of goodness and good people and good things, sober-minded. Can you see he's talking about somebody who's a giver. Not a grabber, not willing to get it anyway. This, this person's a giver. Now, the word filthy lucre, if you look up the Greek words that are translated this when it does appear, it basically means sordid and or shameful. And this, this is an acid test in our life. Are you ashamed? Of how you got it. Because if you are. That's something you don't need to have. That's an indicator. It came the wrong way. You got it the wrong way. Because if the Lord adds it to you. What is there to be ashamed of? Hmm? So whether it's money. Or stuff. Opportunities. We should be so interested in how it came. Go with me to the book of, of Joshua. Joshua chapter 6 and verse 18. The Lord has delivered his people out of Egyptian bondage. The first generation didn't believe him. Wandered around out in the wilderness for 40 years. Finally, finally. Under the leadership of Joshua and Caleb, they're, they're going into the land. 
And the first city to take, Jericho. And you remember how it happened. You know, they marched around the city and the Lord told them to blow the trumpets and they did. And man, the walls came down and they went up and they did what the first generation said could not be done. Hmm? They took the giants and the iron chariots and the walls and none of it stopped them. Proven it wasn't that that stopped them. It was their fear and unbelief that stopped them. And when the Lord told them about this first city, somebody say the first one, the first one. God, God has a thing about the first ones. The first part, the first one. Again and again, he'll say, that's mine. That's mine. And in order to get things the right way, you've got to be real clear on what's yours and what's not yours. Real clear. And he told them, he said, keep yourselves from the accursed thing, or, or actually other translations say devoted, lest you make yourselves accursed. Now you, you'll see this principle. What happened to Naaman? He took something that was not supposed to be taken. And he brought a curse on himself. And it's because he loved it more than he did the things of God. Same thing happened to Judas. Same thing happened to Ananias and Sapphira. When you take of the accursed thing, make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. Verse 19. All the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and the iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. Are you clear on that? Yes. Huh? Yes, sir. All the treasure goes where? It goes where? On this first city on Jericho. Where does all the gold go and all the silver? Are you sure? Is this confusing to you? Hmm? It's never confusing with God. That's why he said, you, should, you can eat any of the trees you want to, but that tree, you do not eat of that tree. But what happened to Eve? Her mind was corrupted from the simplicity of that. It's real simple. That's not our tree. If it's anybody's tree, it's his tree. Leave that tree alone. You can have any of the rest of them. And so as, sure, as surely as you see that and know that, what does the devil come and do? He says, that tree is the one you want. That tree, there is no tree. In fact, there are no other trees when you look at that tree. Nothing else is worth living for. That's the tree. It just happens to be the one the Lord says not yours. And so what happened? Skip down to chapter 7 and verse 11. After that battle that they won, they went up to the next place to Ai and their, the enemy defeated them. And verse 11, the Lord told him, Israel has sinned for they violated my covenant. This is the NIV, which I've commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They put them in their own possessions. Why did they do that? Because they wanted it more, didn't they, than to do what the Lord told them to do. Now, does he never want them to have any gold and silver? No. Later on, he gave them all kind of stuff. But he said, this first one's mine. This first city, all of it's mine. Verse 21, when they finally got down to Achan... He confesses. He said, I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish, Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver. And I saw a wedge of gold of 50 shekels and weight. And I coveted them. And I took them. And they're hid in the earth in the midst of my tent. Well, you know the story. He was judged and his whole family was judged because that they hindered the whole tribe because of this covetousness. And the thing is, on the very next, this, this, this city of Ai, you skip down to the 8th chapter. And you see what God's plan was. Joshua 8, 2. 
You shall do to Ai and her king as you did to Jericho and her king. You're going to have a total victory. Only the spoil thereof and the cattle thereof you shall take a prey for yourselves. Verse 27, that's all yours. I'm giving it to you. And you see, he did that with the next city, after the next city, after the next city, after the next city. All the spoil was theirs. This is why tithing is such a big issue. You say, well, tithing is part of the law. Tithing was before the law. Just like the faith of Abraham was before the law. Long before there was a law, there was tithing. Abraham tithed. Why? Well, eventually the Lord said, the tenth is mine. Do we need to be real clear on what's yours and what's not yours? Hmm? You expect me to be. Don't you? Do you expect me to be real clear on what is the church's money and what is my money? Come on, are y'all looking at me or not? Huh? Should I treat the church's money like it's mine and Phyllis's money personally? No big deal, right? Well, you know, the IRS thinks it's a big deal. But see, people would get all at them and go, yeah, 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 you better watch. Well, what about you? What about you? How's it different for you? You're supposed to treat the Lord's money just like it's yours? How's it any different? It's no different at all. We need to be real clear on what's his and what's ours. And as we're dealing with things in life, what's mine and what's somebody else's, I need to be real clear on it. And no matter how much I need it, and there will be times when you need it. Are y'all with me, friends? Oh, there's been times in Phyllis in my life when, man, we, we needed it. But it wasn't ours. It was somebody else's. It wasn't ours. We needed it. But it's not the right way. It's not the right time. I've had people hand me money, personally. And, man, I needed it. I needed it, but I knew it wasn't right. I mean, it wasn't, they didn't rob a bank or anything. I don't mean that. I just, I, just, I just knew in my heart, no, don't receive that from them. This is not the right time for this. This is not, they don't need to be doing this for their sake. And if you don't pass tests like that, you don't qualify to handle larger things. Because whatever we'd do with a little amount, we'd do with a big amount. True or not? How many want to pass tests? How many want to qualify to handle, handle more? Well, the Bible said, don't be weary in well-doing. What will happen? What will happen? When will you reap? In due season. That's a, a certain time. Is every time due season? No, it's not. Is everybody the right way in the right time? It's not. And you got to be honest with yourself and your heart about what you discern and know. How did that man of God know, don't take anything from Naaman? Today's not the day. He knew that by the Spirit of God. Do you and I have the Spirit of God? Go with me in closing, I think, to Romans 14. Romans 14, and let me... Let me tell you a story I believe you'll really enjoy. Romans 14 and 23. He said the people get in trouble, they're condemned because they do things not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. What pleases God? Faith pleases God. So for something to come right and come His way, it has to come the faith way. Look at the Amplified version of this verse. Amplified. He said, whatever does not originate and proceed from faith is sin. Whatever is done without a conviction of its approval by God is sinful. I heard Brother Kenneth Copeland say years ago, something came up on, on a thing. And he said, if I can't get it by my faith, I don't want it in my house. I like that. I said, I like that. 
It's not just about getting what you want. If it doesn't come the right way, if it doesn't come in the way that pleases the Lord, if he's not in it, if he's not going to get the glory for it, do I really just want it any way I can get it? No. No. He also said this, and it really ministered to me. You know, they, the property they're on there in Texas is, is a large property. And decades ago, they discovered that there was natural gas on that property. This is there in North Texas. And they did a little bit of research into it and a little bit of exploration. And, and the Lord dealt with Brother Copeland to stop. Stop, cap what they had done, and just quit pursuing. And then decades later, I don't know, several years later, decades, the Lord dealt with him, pursue it now. And they did. And uh, of course they had developed some new methods of extraction that were, didn't even exist before. But uh, man, good wells and good reserves and good money. And he said to the Lord, Lord, we could have really used this. You know, back there 20, 30 years ago. And he said, the Lord spoke to him and said, the message must not be the result of the wells. The wells must be the result of the message. People think, well, I, I could have used that. I could have needed it. It makes, it's such a big deal to God how it comes. Yeah. The way it comes. Because if it didn't come from him, his way, his channels, he's not going to get the glory for it. Amen. Somebody else, the king of Sodom, whoever. Yeah. Right? And if we love him and we care about his things and pleasing him the most, then eat, no matter how much we think we want it or need it after the natural, we are unwilling to compromise. Are you with me since we're unwilling? To get it any other way than his way. And if you're really that way, and you're that way year after year and decade after decade, the Lord knows he can trust you. And he will put more and more in your hands. Because he knows it won't go to your head and you won't cling to it and you won't grip it and you won't compromise yourself. Because you've already proved. I only want it. His way. I only want it as it pleases Him. If it's, not, if it's not by our faith, if it doesn't give Him glory, if it's not pleasing to Him, we don't want it in our house. We don't want it in our church. We don't want it in our garage. Are you with me, saints? We, we, we don't want it that way. Why? Because it's not going to please Him unless it comes by faith. Unless we believe Him for it. And we don't want anybody saying, well, yeah, they got all them gas wells. Of course they got money. Yeah, you know, King of Sodom gave him all that. Of course he's got money and stuff. No, no, no. I'd rather not have anything. Did I lose somebody? I'd rather not have it. Then the, the ungodly world or the devil get, get some kind of credit out of it. You? Oh, but God can do it so easily. Can't he? And even though it may look like that you've did, you turned something down, you didn't accept something, you didn't go that way with it, don't you think for a minute it's over. Don't you think you're just going to have to go the rest of your life without it. Come on, are you with me? Say, you're not going to have to. You're not going to have to because when the Lord told him, told the king of Sodom, no, I, I'm not taking anything from you. And when he told Lot that time, take what you want. I'll take the rest. I mean, not long after that, the Lord took him out. He said, look, look out north, south, east, west. I'm giving you this whole thing. Yeah, I'm giving it all to come you. Yeah, That's how you wind up when you do it God's way. Yeah. Maybe some passing of time. May look like other people jump frog ahead of you. That's all right. Don't hurt you to put your flesh under. Right? Develop some patience. Hmm? <laughs> Hebrews 13, 15. Hebrews 13, 15 in the Message Bible. Well, let me read both of them, King James and Message. Let your conversation, let your way of life be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. 
Some people misunderstand that. They think that means you can't ever believe for anything. No, it doesn't mean that. It just means until you get it, you can be happy and satisfied without it. Why? Because you got him. I said you got him. You've got him. The message says, don't be obsessed with getting more material things. Be relaxed with what you have. Everybody say relaxed. Relax. <laughs> be relaxed because God assures us, I'll never let you down, never walk off and leave you. Yeah, things are nice. Sure they are. And it's surely nice to have resources and materials to help bless other people. But if you're vexed and can't be happy until you get that house, until you get that more money or that promotion or that job or that thing, then you're covetous. It means too much to you. And if it means too much to you, you'd be willing to compromise and get it in a way that you ought not get it. Shortcuts and questionable means. Somebody say, I want it God's way. God's time. His channels. And I want him to get all the glory. Stand on your feet, everybody. Oh, thank you, Lord. Just lift your hands. Begin to tell him he's the most important one to you. He has the highest place of all. Come on, tell him out of your own your own heart, your own voice. Lift up your voice. Tell him, Lord, you, you're the most important one to me. There's nothing on earth I desire more than you. Nothing. 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 Nothing I desire more than you. You're everything my heart needs. You're everything my spirit needs. You're everything I need for the present. And for the future, the rest of my life, the rest of my existence. Oh, just lift your hands. Let's praise him some. Lord, we worship you. We give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. We desire you. Tell him you desire him above everything. Lord, I, we desire you more, more, much more than stuff and things. You are our desire. You are our desire. You are, our, you are my desire. You are my desire. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's praise him some. Lift up your hands. Lift up your voices, everybody. Branson and here and on the internet. Lift up your hands. Oh Lord, we praise you. Oh Lord, we long for you. We, we don't covet the things of the world. We covet you. We covet your gifts, your spirit, your things more than anything else. Oh Lord, we worship you. Oh, Lord, we worship you, we worship you, we praise you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, we thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, we thank you, Lord, we thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, tell the Lord, I choose you. I choose you. I choose you, Lord, I choose you. I choose pleasing you. I choose your plan and your way and your will. I choose you, Lord. You, Lord. Oh, I choose you, I choose you, I choose you, I choose you. I desire you. Oh, hallelujah. Let's sing, Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how 
sing it a little bit faster. Oh, how I love Jesus. Everybody say, Than anything here below. I love you more, Lord, than anything I see or feel or know. You're my present and future, you're the beginning and the end. Because you first love me, everybody say. love you more than what I feel. To me, you are more real. I love you more than all this world and all its things and glitz and glam. You're my desire. It's to you to please that I aspire. You're everything to me everybody say oh, oh. How I love Jesus. oh how I love Jesus how I love Jesus oh I love you Lord I love you Lord You know, there are numerous millions of cases where people chose someone else instead of the one they had. And later on, how they regretted it. Some of the people they wrote off and unhooked from chasing the greener grass on the other side became very powerful, became very wealthy, became wonderful and amazing people and they could have been right there with them. They could have been apart, but they chose somebody else, something else. This whole life is that way. There are going to be people at the end of this world that are going to regret that they didn't choose the Lord. It's going to be shameful and pitiful what they forfeited for what they chose. So tiny, so they lost it anyway. Didn't Jesus say if you, if you grasp this life, what will happen? You'll lose it. It'll slip through your fingers. But if you'll give this up and lose it for him, you get it all. How many would say, I choose you, Lord. I choose you. I choose you. I choose you. I choose you. 
Sing it again. Everybody say.